Hello and welcome to In Search of Purpose with Sal Hamby. Welcome to this week's podcast, In Search of Purpose. Today I have to introduce to you Philip Laney. How are you, Philip? I'm great, Sal. Absolutely great. It's a lovely sunny afternoon and all the better for uh, having the chance to chat to you. Well, thanks for coming on. I do really appreciate it today, Philip. Tell us a bit about what it is that uh, that keeps you going and you're in your drive in lockdown at the moment. Tell us what's happening. My drive in lockdown. Um, I there are a number of things. So I, I think you've got to focus on 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 things that are important to you. Um, you know, my children are obviously across the water, so you know we miss them. So it's important that we uh, we engage with them on a regular basis. So. We, we Zoom on an often basis, we've had uh, quizzes, uh, we've had virtual birthday parties. My grandson was one a few weeks back, so having a virtual uh, birthday party with a one-year-old one is, is, uh, is exciting and interesting and a new challenge. Um, but it's great that those facilities are there, so, and you know, that, that, that's been good, uh, keeping in contact with family, so I think, I think that's the key issue. Um, I mean, I, I, it's, it's part of my, DNA. I mean, you know, I, I need to train, I need to get out, I need fresh air. So I'm, you know, I'm quite disciplined and that, you know, I tend to have my to do's and sort of focus on what I need to get addressed the next day. But I always like to start the day with some form of exercise. So Susie, you know, my wife and myself, we've, we've decided that we're either going for a run or for a walk and we like to get out early in the morning. Um, not that there has been much traffic over that period of time. And um, so, how is so early? What's so, early? You know, pardon? What is early for you? Oh, well, early is not as early as it used to be when I was, let's say, in full time employment. Um, you know, I was probably up at sort of quarter past half six mm. most mornings and would have been traveling up to, you know, Port Rush or then into the office, uh, depending on where my uh, place of employment was. So, it's probably half seven now. Um, so, yeah, I'm sort of Taking advantage of, of it, isn't it fantastic listening to the bird call in the morning as well? You know, it's absolutely the sound of silence, but you hear the bird call. So it's, it's great in walking through the empty streets. So there's, there's something about that. But, you know, I think, you know, the whole mental issue and coping with that is, is very important at this difficult time. And, uh, you know, I think it's just you, you've got to accept what we are. You know, there's, there's no sense in worrying about things too much. I think you just, it's carpe diem sort of, you know, it's here, it's now, sort of seize the moment uh, and make the most of it. So, you know, there's been occasions where we had a couple of old bikes out the back and, you know, we're thinking of throwing them out and because we're, we're, we were in the process of, of, of getting some work done to the house. So instead of throwing them out, I, I got onto YouTube and decided that um, I would repair them. So, you know, I, I can uh, break chains, I can remove cranks, uh, fix gears, fix bricks. So, you know, if someone's looking for bicycle repairs, I'm nearly there. I'm nearly there. <laughs> That's great. I know it's it's uh, it's funny you were saying about the birds because uh, a guy that I was um, doing a podcast with a couple of weeks ago there, John Hardy, he is a Green Party politician in Scotland. And uh, he said that it was so surreal to go out and walk around the city centre of Edinburgh and the only sound he heard was birds. I, I, look, I, I, I think it's fantastic and obviously seeing people walking, exercising, cycling, um, you know, and, and I, I just I just think that's great because, you know, when C and I are out walking or running, you know, we, we, we've noticed a lot more people, but I, I think the whole, the whole environment is it's good. Obviously, you know, my background, I, I spent a lot of time as an engineer in renewable energy, so wind farms, etc. And, um, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of focused on that as well. Um, so, you know, if we can take a lot of cars off the highways and get people out and exercising and, and walking. But it's interesting you say that because last night we were walking up the road not far away and there was obviously more traffic on the roads. Mm. You know, we're, we're easing out of lockdown. And there were these short periods of silence and you could hear the birds. And I said to Sue, you know, like the birds have been there all the time, but we just don't hear them because of the traffic. And it was just so nice just to hear that little gap and hear the birds away in the background. Mm. So I, I think, you know, there are a lot of negatives that have happened with COVID, but I, I think 
you know, there are some positives as well, and it's important, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm not, I have a political bias in, in any way, but I do think the environment, it's, it's so important. If you look at the skies, you look at our rivers, you know, the lack of pollution, uh, except in certain areas, obviously, where the DIYers have decided to uh, wash their brushes and, and turps and, and flush it down the inappropriate uh, drain. Um, other, other than that, it would appear over the world, you know, the blue lagoons are blue. Uh, yeah. They're not, they're not uh, sort of black with contamination. I know it's it is it's fascinating and I, I've noticed that there's a lot of flowers that are coming up in the garden that have always come up in the garden but usually I'll see it when it's um, in a bud and then it's on the on the ground and the petals have gone and I think my goodness I've missed that whole process uh, whereas now I'm literally watching it flourish and develop each and every day something that I do love to connect with but often find myself caught up in so many other things as many people are if not most people so it's really really nice to connect again with those little things that um, I do value and always have but never had the opportunity to be so heavily immersed within it to grow on my own vegetables and things instead of just thinking my goodness that courgette has actually turned into a marrow because I haven't went near it I actually get to have a courgette for dinner not a marrow soup. <laughs> well if you, um, you know, we would go for walks and runs down the normal embankment and I think obviously because of furlough and, and the council's uh, on, on financial or experience and financial difficulties, we don't have the sort of verge grass cutters, etc. But if you go down the Ormo embankment on the inside of the fence, just beside the wagon, the wildflowers are fantastic. You know, the poppies are just a whole, I don't know the names, but a whole raft of fantastic colour, you know, in its natural environment. And I mean, you know, you do see the bees and you see the, the birds and, and one thing or another. So I do take time out of my, my runs and, and, and observe. And, you know, it was just lovely seeing, you know, nature at one for itself. Like, well. I know it is. And, you know, it's, it's interesting how people meet as well. You know, we met through a, a, a mutual friend and it's nice, you know, to hear different stories about, you know, what makes people tick. And I was very interested you know, to hear about your, your past, your backstory, essentially. So for people who are watching or listening to this at the moment, um, it'd just be really interesting if you could give us a bit of a backstory into um, your rugby days. Well, my rugby days, now, now I, I, probably the, the audience might not be, uh, might be too young to remember my rugby days. Um, my, my first love, actually, Sal, was, was soccer. And um, I mean, I, I'm a Balabina guy, so went to a little school in Ballymena called Haribo Primary School and I loved soccer. Uh, didn't like studying, I just loved soccer and I played soccer. And then I came to the 11 plus stage and um, I was fortunate enough I, I passed the 11 plus and I went to the grammar school, I went to Ballymena Academy. And that was my first introduction to rugby. Um, so I was kitted out every Saturday morning for the under 12, 13s, 14s. But on a Tuesday and Thursday, I was actually going um, to the local secondary school gymnasium and playing indoor soccer with my, my, my friends from primary school. And I kept, I kept that buzz going. And I actually said to people, you know, if, if I got a call uh, to play a soccer match or a rugby match, I would actually play the soccer match ahead of, ahead of the rugby. But look, I, I, I was fortunate and, you know, there's a lot about being in the right place at the right time. And, you know, after, after going to Ballymena Academy, I was fortunate enough to go to Queen's. And I arrived at Queen's when there was an influx of such talent. Um, I mean, it, it, Queen's uh, has, has generated and developed so many fantastic international world rugby players. But just at that period, you know, some of the late 70s, early 80s, we just had such talent um, that went on to play for, for Ulster, Ireland, the British Lions, etc. And to have a group of guys with that skill set um, there at the same time with the same desire to enjoy themselves. So again, we, we, the, we were, there was a facilitator um, and, and facilitators are important. Why do they call them coaches, mentors? But facilitators, they have to identify and recognize the, the asset that is there and then how to get the best out of that asset. And the guy who was our coach was a minister, the Reverend Derek Aldridge, the, the late Reverend Derek Aldridge. And he wasn't really a coach, but he identified that we had the skills, but 
he trained us so hard. We were the fittest team in, in Ireland, without doubt, with the result that we wanted to run the ball from anywhere on the pitch, whether it's behind our goal line or wherever we decided we're not kicking the ball because our, our number 10, the out half, wasn't a great kicker. So we decided we wanted to run everything. And because we were a smallish team um, and, uh, relative to the likes of the big packs of CI or Ballymena, we weren't winning a lot of balls. So it was important when we got the ball, we kept it. So this philosophy and everyone was just wanted to get our hands on the ball and the enthusiasm. And then when we were training, we, there was a competitive streak. We, you know, we wanted to beat each other, whether we were lifting heavier weights or whether we were sprinting. There was just a healthy competitive edge. And you know, to to I played with those guys obviously helped me, um, which ultimately you know led to playing for Ulster and and um, for Ireland and uh, touring New Zealand, Japan, Australia, you know, different countries. So I'm blessed. I'm, you know, very, very lucky that, you know, right place, right time. But the most important thing out of that side is the friendships I have made rugby-wise uh, through the game and, you know, in different countries. Uh, no more so than just their last, uh, the end of uh, fall last year when the Rugby World Cup was in Japan, that Sue and I headed out to an old friend I met in 1985. And we stayed with Bunsen Oikawa and his family for uh, the two weeks of the World Cup. Really? That, that, is, that to me is, you know, the, the bond that, that rugby has. And the guys I played with at Queen's, you know, we, we were called the Warriors of the 80s. We have a WhatsApp group to keep in touch. We meet every Christmas for a little drink and a meal. Yeah. And you know what? The older we get, the better we were. Yeah, it sounds really lovely. It's such a, a great experience that you had. In, in all of that. And I believe that you're still uh, on a, an advisory board capacity with the rugby, is that right? Yeah, well, it, it's it's when I was in your blood, Sal, it's, it's, it's hard to pass over. When I stopped playing, then I got involved in, you know, various management positions. And again, you know, the timing of that, again, I, I just look at, you know, right place, right time, because I, I, I looked after Irish under 20s and under 21s for a number of years. But I had, you know, I, I came across a very young Brian O'Driscoll, a very young Ronan O'Gara, a very young Paul O'Connell, you know, when these, these these are just young guys out of school embarking on their next step. But I actually have worked with those guys and hopefully influenced them in some way and to see that they've progressed to become world international rugby players. Again, it was fantastic working with them and, and, and those friendships are still there. So, you know, from, and I suppose that's part of trying to give something back, you know, is, and again, it's amateur day, so we, you know, I had a job, I had a nine to five, I had Susie and, the, and three kids, and then I was still playing rugby and doing these trips away and stuff. So it's, you know, squeezing all that in. Um, but, you know, rugby in those days sort of opened up doors. You know, I'm not saying it was a buddy buddy system, but, you know, even in the business community, it, it, it was such that, you know, you, you, you probably had a position of standing and, and sort of respect. And so that, 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 that helps in one very early stage of a career. Um, but I suppose laterally then it was just trying to give something back uh, administratively, administratively. So I've been um, involved in the commercial side of, of, of Ulster Rugby, um, so the chairman of their, their uh, commercial committee, which, you know, is, is interesting and, and obviously it, it has had its challenges. Um, over the last number of years and, and more recently obviously with COVID. I actually didn't know a terrible amount about rugby until um, I had the pleasure of doing a podcast a while back with Billy Burns. Mm. It was a really, really good experience because um, it allowed me to really envisage exactly what you know his, his role within the team was, understanding the, the compassion and the, the team spirit and the community of playing as part of a team like that and um you know just being out of the game for a particular amount of time which he now is due to lockdown and the the stringent kind of um he's still you know going to be a couple of times a week he still has to, he's got a little bit of home gym that they that Ulster will be set up for him give him some some gear so he was able to practice away and then they're doing a lot of zoom pilates zoom core work uh, you know, meditations, everything. They're they're trying their best to keep it as rounded and as grounded as possible. But essentially, they just want to get back on the field. You do, and I mean, you mentioned someone like Billy, and Billy Billy slotted in so well. Um, you know, last season at, at Ulster Rugby, 
and you know that that's an important thing um you know for these guys coming um into the province you know traditionally you know when when and when you played amateur rugby if you were born in Ulster, you played for Ulster, and that was it you didn't play for anybody else professionalism has changed all that and you know you've got players coming from all over the world and and the important thing is that they fit in a with the team the squad the whole structure but the community and um, I think that's great because there are a lot of little side stories, and I'm not divulge some of them, but there are a lot of little side stories where guys, you know, they're 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 there at Kingspan, they're giving their all, they're playing particularly well. But outside that, you know, they they are doing things in the community, and I and I think that's great. You know, whether it's working with old people, etc., and, and and having chats, um, you know, that's really good. But Professional rugby, I suppose, you know, when we were amateurs, we did it because we wanted to. And I suppose professionalism, you sort of have to, you know, because there are, there, you're, you're getting paid for it and, and there's an expectation of fitness level, performance level. But you, you mentioned a point there in the cell that, that, it, that it's key, and I suppose it's key for everybody in the lockdown, you know, is, is solitude, um, you know, in that quiet space. And, you know, when the guys are there and you're in front of 15, 16,000, or in the case, you know, playing for Ireland in front of 50, 60,000, it's, it's a fantastic experience and it's a great, great buzz. Um, but then, you know, then you have to go back and I suppose there's, there's, there's the quietness. And one of the challenges those professional guys now have, and I've, I was reading something about it earlier today, you know, that they... The, the social media side of things has, has a major influence. It, it influences all. We all like to think people like us. We all like to think what we do is, is nice and then we'll get a pat on the back. Now, unfortunately, with Twitter, Facebook, whatever way you want, you know, people, um, it's the faceless voice of communication. I know. They can, they can say and air their views, which, you know, if you start reading into it too much, it, 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 it can be very hurtful. And I think a lot of sportsmen struggle with that. They do struggle with time management as well because they are in strict routines and, and, and regimes. And you know, when that gets out of kilter, either through injury or something like lockdown, it's oh, you know, hang on, I've got to get into a routine here. Yeah. And you know, and any any sphere of, of work, you know, mental stability is, is very, very important. And what I, I like now is the overt nature of people prepared to discuss that whether it's you know prince william or or the rugby players or whatever you know they're talking about it and saying look guys you're not alone you know this is something that you know we all go through highs and lows of some degree in life and that's how we deal with but you know and you, you don't necessarily have to do it in your own you know because there is a there is a a bond there's a group of friends so i think you know i think the one they're using at the moment through aware is like you know phone a friend mm. or whatever mm. you know just 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 to keep that going and i i probably try to do that a little bit in sort of the business mentoring uh style and that i i believe some individuals who are running great organizations perhaps just need a business body okay so i i go in as a business buddy and i'm quite happy to analyze their p l balance sheets and strategic plans but that individual is so important you know what what's his downtime you know because mm -hmm. his brain is you know particularly if he's in a small business he's everything from managing director to sales to probably you know tidying up the messy jobs locking up etc so what's his on what on you know how does he unwind he or she unwind and that's so important. So when I go out and do some business mentoring, yeah, we'll look at the objectives, you know, from a business plan point of view. But it's getting to know that individual and know how to get, let's say, better performance out of that individual by doing less, but yeah. doing it in a different way. And and that's all part of rugby as well, is sort of, you know, knowing that if you've had a bad day, it doesn't mean to say you go and pump iron and train and murder yourself, you know. And then go out the next day and the pressure's on you to feel this. And that, that's what those guys are feeling now. And it's really, and again, I, I probably, and that, that's, you know, older and experienced is that I don't really care what people think. You know, I, I have to be me. I have to be honest to myself. And, you know, if I have a bad day, well, I put my hands up. You know, I, you know, it just didn't go well. But move on, you know, move on mm -hmm. and be positive about it.
no i know you're exactly right and it is that kind of thing where if you do sort of bust yourself the day before you go out you know in, into the likes of a, of a field and, and play with people you're probably going to be half as ready to perform as if you had to just taken a rest the day before that's the whole point isn't it it's that less is more at times of need in order to actually succeed better later well it, it, it is sound i think you've got to look at you know other areas of whether the term is distractions or whatever i know you love your music you know and that's that's great solace to you. you you can put your heart and soul in that and you know again it's you know, go up to the music room and chill out and enjoy yeah. yourself just forget about all that acupuncture and what you were doing and, <laughs> and the stresses of strains and you know we we all have something in there that we need to you know need to go to so you know whether it's reading a good book or a series of books or whether it's you know some type of music and probably music to me as well has been now my my music is rather eclectic and somewhat different than your own. I was brought up in the Salvation Army, uh-huh. so I I um, you know deeply indebted to my parents for you know bringing me up that route because it was cross denominational and you know it was fantastic. However, you know being in the Salvation Army is a very very big part of one's life and that you you know the whole family is in it. Tell us so, a bit about that. I'm interested to hear more. Oh, it's, 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 it's a church, um, you know, and, and it was founded by William Booth um, many, many moons ago. But, you know, a lot of people think it's more of a charity, but it actually is a, a, a church of worship. Okay. So I, I was brought up in a very religious in, in environment. And, you know, my, my Sundays would have been very much all around my commitment to the Salvation Army. Um, you know, my, my father would have been, a, I think he was a, a band master, so he would have conducted the band. My mum was involved in the songsters, which would have been the choir. So we we were all encouraged to, you know, learn how to play an instrument, try and sing, and then even take Sunday schools and things like that. But, you know, church for us on a Sunday was, you know, a service at 10, another service at 11, Sunday school at quarter to two, an afternoon open air service, because the Salvation Army would go around developments and, and spread the gospel. That was its way of doing it. And um, then in the evening, there was a directory uh, class at six for young people before the seven o'clock evening service and then a Bible study after that. So you're probably, you know, from about nine in the morning to 10 at night. And again, it was all very strict. And I'm not saying it was just because it was Balamina, but, you know, I wasn't allowed to play on Sundays or anything. You know, I had to put the football away. It, 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 didn't, it didn't get an idea. But, I mean, I, I took those principles with me on my, my journey through life. Now, I, I may not be, uh, as you said, as an, an active participant as I, as I was there. And I think, you know, when I went to college, I learned a lot because I wanted to see what other denominations, why, why were there other denominations? Um, you know, so I, I, I went to Mass, I, I went to different churches, Church of Ireland, Presbyterian churches, Brethren churches, Free Presbyterian churches, because all I ever knew was the Salvation Army. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I always had this interest when I go away to a country, you know, sort of I'm in Rome, you know, I had to go to the Vatican and experience the Vatican and understand that. Um, but, you know, so there's principles in life I got uh, or sort of that, that were there. And then when I went to university, I made my own decisions, you know, and whether I wanted to be as active as I, as I was in the end of it. But the, the love of music was always there. And, um, you know, again, it's, it's, you know, I love brass band music. So, you know, I, I can sort of fluff away at my cornet or trumpet and stuff like that there. But I, I, I haven't practiced, so don't be asking me to give you a <laughs> I actually didn't know this part at all, unless we but, talked about it briefly. But I, I, there's certain elements of music, I, you know, just, it, it means a lot to me. So whether, you know, it's an organ recital of Bach, Toccata, Fugue and D minor, or Mozart's first French horn concerto, or, uh, you know, there, there's their post horn gallop, you know, but then, you know, these other, you know, there's a, an Austrian group called Mosel Brass, very, very entertaining. Um, you know, there's a ukulele orchestra of Great Britain. You know, again, it's, it's an eclectic mix. Um, and I suppose if, if I if I hear a brass band playing, so you know, if, if I'm downtown at Remembrance there or something, and, and one of the regimental bands is playing, I get hairs in the back of my neck. Mm. You know, just because mm. I used to march, you know, with the Salvation Army up and down that, and it was just fantastic. And my my late father was associated with. 
sort of the army. He worked to the army as a as a civilian in St. Patrick's Barracks in Ballymena. And I was fortunate enough that I used to get private tuition in my French horn from the, the bandmaster up in the army. But I got to see lots of their uh, passive walk parades and everything associated with that. And it was, oh, fantastic. Just the buzz, the, the buzz you get. So like tripping of the color, I mean, it looks a bit pedestrian, but when you see something like that, or the festival in Edinburgh, you know, the tattoo and all those guys doing the regiment and stuff. I, I, I love it, but I also appreciate the talent that some of those guys have for, for, uh, for doing different things. And, and saying that, the guitar chappy that we met at your house that night, David, my son and myself, we went to see his concert at the Black Box. Oh, Paddy, Paddy Anderson, amazing. Paddy, we, right. you know, because I, I, again, I, I just appreciate wonderful talent. And we said we'd go, so David and my son, who David's a talented musician as well, um, I shouldn't say as well. David is a talented musician, and his own right. <laughs> we went down to see Paddy, and it, like you know, I, I just sat in awe, you know, with my mouth open, watching him up and down the frets and doing whatever he was doing, and like it, it was great. So, in a very long-winded way, so I'm just saying you need other avenues to escape and other channels, and I suppose in lockdown, we've had the opportunity. To, to just go and chill out and explore those other channels. We so have, Philip. I I, I actually hadn't performed a concert or a gig in a couple of years until September when Paddy and I did a gig together at the Flax Mill in Dungiven, which was a really mm. nice festival. And I don't really play much that often. I do get asked on occasion, but yeah. I just choose very selectively the little concerts that I like to play and be a part of now because then they're extra special in my mind. And uh, I hadn't picked up the guitar since after the gig as well with Paddy on, in September until two nights ago. Yeah. And it took weeks. It's funny, I, I, I had these dreams that I was, I was playing and I allowed myself the time to play and I allowed myself to reconnect with it. And a friend of mine, Frank Liddy, he often looks upon it. When you, when you put a guitar or an instrument down, it's like you're putting it into the coffin. And it's going into the coffin. And, you know, it, it sort of resurrected itself out of the coffin, mm -hmm. out of the box in which it's in, you know, and uh, it, it, it came alive. I came alive with it two nights ago. Um, I was playing Donovan and oh, just amazing. I love some English folk, you know, as well. So an American folk and Joni Mitchell and the lot. So it was absolutely brilliant um, to play. So, yeah, I've just and I sent it through to a couple of friends and uh this is just like riding a bike to you. You know, I hadn't played it in so long and it was just, I just felt so alive in playing something that yeah. it's just been sitting there gathering dust for, I don't know how long. Well, I, I know, and I, I think it is a shame and, and you, know, you look, I look back and sort of think, yeah, music was important too and I learned a brass instrument. I played an orchestra and bands and stuff like that and I, I had a good time. But I suppose, yeah, I wished I'd maybe not been taken to a piano, but I'd love to have been able to appreciate a, a piano. I, I, you know, I look at it now and I, I, I studied the theory of music, so I, I can work things out, but my brain's not working quick enough. And likewise, the guitar. Mm -hmm. So, you know, during lockdown, um, I have had my guitar out and I've been trying to, you know, do Beatles Blackbird and stuff like that. And um, slowly, slowly, but my problem is I'm trying to, you know, I'm looking, I'm looking at the chords and the frets and then my brain's, my brain's trying to work out my where, where is this? Because in a brass instrument, you know, if someone says play middle G, I know exactly where it is. Whereas this is going, now that's a chord. So that's yeah. like, that's, that's C, that's E, that's G, that's C. Right, okay, I've worked that out now. But I, it just hasn't clicked yet. Mm. And I hope I've been, you know, once, once the tips of my fingers harden up a bit, mm. I get more used to it. My brain will also be working out quicker as well. Yeah. I know Jack, he, he doesn't sing. I hear him singing the odd time in the shower and things like that, but he would well, never. Yeah, mate, he's allowed to do that. He's allowed to sing in the shower. So. Exactly, he is. I allow it. But he plays bass. And oh. uh, he, he's been playing away, but he obviously he, just, he doesn't sing with the bass. He just plays. And um, it's funny, the only song I've ever got him to sing with me ever was Blackbird. Oh, right. And uh, he, we sort of do a bit of harmonizing and stuff. And, he was, we didn't mean to do it. We just one day sat down and I was singing it and he started singing with me. I looked at him and he looked at me and 
we're just sighing at each other at the same time. And I says, let's do that again. Yeah, no, nope, that's it. <laughs> done, over, move on. <laughs> you, you, you talk about harmony there. Um, my son, David, um, uh, is out in the Philippines and has been out in the Philippines pre-lockdown and, and uh, is obviously isolated out there. But his girlfriend, um, Gliza, Gliza Galera, uh, is a local musician. And um, she's a lovely, lovely singer. But uh, she decided to compose a, a song for the lockdown. And she was transmitting it through the various social channels. And um, unknown to us, she actually got David to do a harmony with her. Now, David's a bit shy, obviously, of, of this. But they, they, they did this lovely harmony piece, which was really nice. Um, and then they also composed a song for Charlie's birthday. Uh, oh. my one-year-old grandson so you know it, it look it's, it's it's lovely and i, I just think mu music is just a great vehicle a great channel and uh, whether you know the guys i was talking you know go back to billy billy may you know might want to play rocky music to get himself psyched up um miller mm -hmm. do people do different things and then sort of afterwards whether he's just chilling out to something really relaxing but um no, it's a, a, a great vehicle, a great channel, and I, I think in schools, you know, should really be encouraged, not necessarily forcing kids that like you've got to learn the flip and squeeze mm -hmm. violin or something, but just make it enjoyable, interesting, and and you know, because I think if you can get them involved at that stage, that will stay with them for the rest of their lives, and at some stage, it'll, it'll click and they'll go, just like you ride in the bike, you get back on it again, you go, oh, isn't that isn't that that great? You know, just a great feeling and great satisfaction. I know, and when people are going to go back to playing sports. My mum's very excited. I think it's the seventeenth of June or something. The football starting back up, and she's very excited. Um, but they're not playing to audiences, are they? No, that that's that's the big downside on it all. Um, so, and you know, I, <laughs> having played for Ulster on numerous occasions at Ravenhill, as it was called, when you had two men and a dog. I, I fully appreciate what it's like to play with not a big audience, <laughs> but we, we've 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 moved on from there. And you know, I I, I think there there is pressure, probably financially, commercially, and TV wise, to to get them playing again, so at least they can provide some coverage. But you know, the atmosphere will be as you know dead as a donut. Although I I do believe that they're going to have sort of recordings of of people cheering when goals go in, but. Uh, I'm going to be people waving, you know, sort of static, static robots or something. But um, it will be an entirely different atmosphere. And, uh, you know, soccer is, is going to go back earlier than rugby. And rugby will have its challenges because obviously of the, of the contact nature that rugby has. So, uh, look, I think for a lot of people, trying to get a new normal is, is important. We don't know, none of us know what that new normal is going to be. But as long as we're on the pathway to that, that's important. Yeah, exactly. And um, I can I can remember when I, I used to live, I don't know if I ever told you this, I used to live in Ravenhill um, looking on to Perry Park. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Old Methody Park. Mm, and the the old rugby practice pitch was up, was it up at Mary's Peter track or up around the House of Sport? It used to be the practice ground for the Ulster rugby. They, they did. It was up in the, um, uh, the police place up there. They used to of a practice and then they moved it down to Perry Park about five years ago um, and it was so funny because um, all my friends all of a sudden became more of a friend and they would all want to come around and watch the rugby and the <laughs> the world practicing. <laughs> well, it's the place to be, I mean it's a social gathering, I mean you know even at Kingspan on a, on a Friday night there are a number of people who have no interest at all in what's happening on the pitch. It's all about social interaction and the place to be and good crack as, as we like to say and or we province. Exactly, I know that. And I'm sure everyone's just really, really looking forward to getting back to everything of their normal. I mean, is there something that you're really, really looking forward to that um, you're going to do whenever this is sort of come back to semi-normal, Philip? I think um, I have two priorities. Uh, so Donegal is, is a special place for me. Um, and I only got to know Donegal through Susie uh, and that her, her relatives were up there. So when she introduced me, a long, long time ago to Donegal, you know, I, I just, I just fell in love with the place. Uh, Something around Port Nablad on Flanachy. And um, 
Seapaven Bay, and uh, like it's just it's just a special place, and uh, you know it's not it's not a, a subject to be morbid, but I'd like it to be my resting place. <laughs> Uh, you know, because it's, it's it's just special special memories, and my kids we've brought our children up there, and they 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 love it too. So getting up to Donegal would be would be important to me. Um, I'd also like to see the kids, um, you know, sort of in the flesh. As as I said, Zoom and uh, Microsoft Team and everything is fantastic. Um, you know, and, and 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 my my children are obviously very special, and and no more so than little Charlie, my grandson, who is developing at a rate of knots. Um, so just you know, experiencing that development cycle as a grandparent is is something probably we're missing out on because they do say that it is an entirely different than bringing up your own children. You can give give the grandchildren back. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it becomes more hassle. So you know, th th those are a couple of personal things. But I suppose you know, for us all, it's just trying to get back into some formal, normal way of life. That you know, we have to live with this COVID. We have to live with it. But we get, you know, we're we're comfortable in each other's spaces, and we try and get community things working again, business things working again, and and people. Sort of wanting to get out and experience, as opposed to be, you know, in, an, in a cosseted environment where there's a fear of, you know, don't want to go out. So, you know, and when that is, I don't know, Sal, because obviously antibody tests, vaccinations, etc., all all need to be part of it. But, you know, it's it's just growing in confidence and just getting that relaxation that, that let's, you know, let let's get back out there and, and, and try and get as as close to normal as we can. I know. I hope that these, these are essentially podcasts I, I'm I'm experiencing and and working through through the process of lockdown, and they're they're called in search of purpose. And it's just so interesting to talk to so many different people from so many different walks of life, and and just seeing people's genuine dealings and handlings and and attitudes of the particular current situation of COVID-19 and how we're all dealing with it and I just hope that in years to come when we all look back on this that we all got something as much as it is extremely you know it, it's just horrible what's actually happening but at the same time trying to take some silver lining amongst it in order to be able to get something from it in the process of it is, is all we can actually do so I'm hoping that we, we all can do that and I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you thank you so much for coming on to the podcast and having this uh, conversation discussion with me today Philip and I wish you all the best thank you very much Sal I enjoyed it and you look after yourself and take care thank you